Evidence-based healthcare is part of a cultural shift in the current healthcare practice that aims to provide patients with the best quality of care by integrating the best evidence with clinical expertise and the individual patient's values and circumstances. Evidence-based medicine and evidence-based practice terms are used interchangeably. You may see evidence-based medicine, evidence-based practice, evidence-based clinical practice, evidence-based healthcare, or evidence-based athletic training used in different contexts. Over the past 20 years, the focus of allied healthcare educational settings have changed drastically, shifting from the mastery of technical skills to the critical assessment and utilization of evidence in the diagnostic process, implementation of interventions, and the assessment of patient outcomes. Evidence-based practice or medicine can be described as a decision-making process integrating the research with the clinical expertise and an individual patient's values. Sackett and Deniger and Hurdle gave us the definition of evidence-based medicine. So let me ask you a question. Which clinician would you want? Let's say you've got a runny nose, you're not feeling so hot and you think you might have the flu. Do you want the wise and experienced older physician or do you want the smart young physician? Well, most of us would say we want a combination. We want somebody that has the experience, but also someone who's up on the new technology. This creates lifelong learning. The hardest conviction to get into the mind of a beginner is that the education upon which he is engaged is not a medical course, but a life course for which the work of a few years under teachers is but a preparation. This was Sir Oliver Osler from the Student of Medicine, a text that was published a long time ago in 1892. As early as then, he described this lifelong learning process. The prognosis of ignorance is poor. Unfortunately, research has shown that the relationship between clinical experience and our quality of healthcare declines the longer we're in practice. So it's important as we enter the workforce and then as we continue in the workforce that we use research and we use evidence and we use our clinical expertise to help drive our practices. As we talk about research, sometimes information can kind of be an overload. So how do we get the output we want? Well, good question. We're going to answer that as we go through. Clearly asking and answering questions is central to the practice of evidence-based medicine and information mastery. We will learn about clinical questions and how to ask better ones. We will also talk about how to answer them and to look at the evidence. One approach is the five-step approach. Number one is creating a clinical relevant question and then searching for the best available evidence. Then we critically analyze the evidence. Then we integrate the appraisal with the personal clinical expertise and patient preferences. These are our POMs, our patient-oriented evidence that matters, which we'll talk about in a minute, and our DOES, our disease-oriented medicine. Lastly, we evaluate the performance or the outcomes of our actions. We can see that this is a cyclical process. We want to continue looking for the best evidence and see if it has an outcome that is favorable for our patient. We need to reassess and possibly choose a different intervention so we can get a different outcome. One of the things that can help us is a well-built clinical question. It's directly relevant to the care of the patient and our knowledge deficit. They should contain the following elements, either the patient or problem being addressed, the intervention or exposure being considered, the comparison intervention or exposure when relevant, the clinical outcome of interest, and sometimes includes a time component. By constructing these well-built clinical questions, it helps us to model lifelong learning techniques for our colleagues and our students. These questions are answerable and thus reinforce the satisfaction of finding evidence that makes us better and faster clinicians. These are some different models, either a PO, a PICO, or a PCOT, that include the patient or problem, intervention or prognostic factor or exposure, a comparison group, an outcome, and time or type of study, which we'll talk about. All of the following could be used to help you define your population. 
A population simply identifies a group to whom the results of a systematic review will apply. While it's often implied, it's better to be specific. For example, instead of asking, what is the most accurate test for the diagnosis of chest pain? Adults are somewhat implied in here. It's better to say, in adults with chest pain, what is the most accurate test? The following factors could be used to help define the population, such as age, race, or gender, clinical setting, maybe an emergency department or primary care office, comorbidities, such as patients known with heart disease or patients with diabetes, and geographical location, rural versus urban. When we think of the term intervention, we usually picture a prescription for a drug. Remember though, an intervention can also include surgery, complementary or alternative medicine, exercise or physical therapy, counseling, a combination of treatments compared to a single treatment or to a different combination, or patient or medical education. Remember that diagnostic tests is also a form of intervention, which include things like blood tests, imaging like CT or MRI scans, or other tests like an endoscopy or cardiac stress test, history and physical exams, clinical decision rules, and essentially anything that we do to or for our patients is an intervention and could be the topic for a clinical question. There is usually more than one option when making a decision about an intervention. So which drug would we choose to treat acute bronchitis? We could use amoxicin, erythromycin, or possibly no antibiotics. So which one's the best? Doing nothing, also known as premium no noceri, is also an option. After all, many new and promising interventions have turned out to be worse than doing nothing at all. Finally, each well-formed clinical question should also have an outcome. This is important because not including an outcome makes it much harder to answer the question. For example, when asking a question about hypertensive therapy, is your outcome blood pressure, cardiovascular mortality, or an all-cause mortality? Patient-oriented evidence that matters, or a POEM, provides information on things that patients would be most concerned about, such as morbidity, mortality, symptom improvement, healthcare cost, and the quality of life. Disease-oriented evidence, such as physiological information, things like blood pressure and joint range of motion measures, or symptoms, such as a headache and nausea, disease-oriented evidence has traditionally been gathered by clinicians, and may also be referred to as clinician-oriented evidence. We also have patient-oriented outcome measures, which are self-reported questionnaires that patients complete throughout the treatment to assess their quality of life. The last thing we might want to address is the time or the type of study we're interested in. Sometimes, especially in sports, returning an athlete to play in a certain amount of time is really important. Those of you that might have been former athletes know that you only have so many months for a season or even weeks sometimes. We may not always have a lot of time to return somebody to sports participation, so that may be important. Evidence-based practice is much more than just research though. Clinical expertise is the clinician's accumulated experience, education, and clinical skills. The patient values are what the patient brings to the encounter from his or her own personal and unique concerns, expectations, and values. And then we have the best research evidence, which is usually found in the clinically relevant research that has been conducted using a sound methodology. One of the most important things to remember about evidence-based medicine is that it starts and ends with the patient. The patient's preferences must be considered at all times. Just because research says something is the best does not necessarily mean that that patient agrees with it and therefore may not be the correct course of treatment. Evidence alone is never sufficient to make a clinical decision. Initially, the focus of evidence-based medicine emphasized using randomized clinical trials and other quantifiable methods. However, as evidence-based medicine has evolved, so has the realization that the evidence from clinical research is only one key component of the decision-making process and does not tell a practitioner what to do. 
So how do we find information that can help us answer these clinical questions? We may have to go use evidence found in databases. Filtered information is where other clinicians and researchers have already searched the existing evidence, evaluated it, and synthesized a clinical recommendation. Some examples of filtered information include critical practice guidelines, critically appraised topics, also known as CATS, Cochrane reviews, evidence-based synopsis, meta-analysis, and systematic reviews. Unfiltered information includes individual research studies and expert opinions. A Boolean term, for example, and, or, or not, may be used to help us reduce or increase our medical search. MeSH terms are the controlled medical vocabulary used in the United States National Library of Medicine in PubMed and Medline databases. Sometimes these can be helpful in searching for specific topics. We then have to evaluate the evidence. The level of evidence can help clinicians decide which pieces of evidence are stronger or weaker than others. We have several appraisal scales that are used to assess the diagnosis of individual research studies. Also understanding some key terms, reliability indicates how reproducible the results are when the measurement should be the same. Intra-rater reliability values determine how consistent measures by a single researcher or instrument are. Inter-rater reliability is the reliability of measurements between several researchers or instruments. Validity is the assurance that the measurement represents what we think they represent. Diagnostic accuracy is the ability of a diagnostic test or technique to discriminate between disease, injury, or health. A positive likelihood ratio tells the clinician how much more likely the patient is to have the condition if their diagnostic test is positive. A negative likelihood ratio can tell an athletic trainer or clinician how less likely the patient is to have the condition if their diagnostic test is negative. The risk of injury is data from observational studies that's used to determine the distribution of injury or disease in a population such as the incident, incident rate, and prevalence. The treatment effectiveness is the assessment of the effectiveness of a treatment or intervention. So let's examine the process. We're in a pickle. Pickles will kill you. Every pickle you eat brings you nearer to death. Amazingly, the thinking man has failed to grasp the terrifying significance of the term in a pickle. Pickles are associated with all major diseases in the body. Eating them spreads wars and communism. They can be related to most airline tragedies. Auto accidents are caused by pickles, and there exists a positive relationship between crime waves and consumption of this fruit. So let's run the numbers. These numbers were thrown out and they're published online. You can go find them if you want. Just because it's out there, just because it's on the internet, doesn't necessarily mean it's true. Let's take an evidence-based approach to see if this is true. There's some additional data. Nearly all sick people have eaten pickles. The effects are obviously cumulative. 99.7% of the people involved in all air and auto accidents have eaten pickles within 14 days preceding the accident. 93.1% of juvenile delinquents come from homes where pickles are consumed. 99.9% .9 of all people who die from cancer have eaten a pickle. 100% of all soldiers have eaten pickles, and 96.8% of all red communist sympathizers have eaten pickles. We also have evidence that points to the long-term effects of pickle eating. Of the people born in 1839 who later dined on pickles, there's been a 100% mortality rate. All pickle eaters born between 1910 and 1929 have wrinkled skin, have lost most of their teeth, have brittle bones, and failing eyesight if the ills of pickle eating have not already caused their death. Even more convincing is the report of a noted team of medical specialists that said rats force fed with 20 pounds of pickles per day for 30 days developed bulging abdomens. Their appetites for wholesome foods were destroyed. What do we do? I know, we'll just outlaw all consumption of pickles. Remember, only you can fight death by pickles. Or, 
we could use evidence-based practice to examine the palms and does associated with pickle consumption. So let's get started. We have our clinical expertise. Me, I've eaten pickles and I'm still here. I think I'm kicking. I know others who have done the same and they're still in good health. I would think that if this was an actual problem, pickles wouldn't be available in the supermarket. With this, we have our patient values. Pickles are just flat out delicious. Pickles complement my sandwich, hamburgers, salad, and even a hot dog. Many pregnant women would be completely heartbroken if they can't have pickles and peanut butter. So this seems like a real conundrum. And the best research evidence. I've seen this data, but do I believe it? Are the statistics reasonable? And can they be substantiated? Obviously, this report was for amusement and demonstration purposes only. Although many of the statements are probably true, they're kind of useless when you actually look at it. There are situations for which value and credibility of the report cannot be easily assessed, such as the crime rate associated with pickle consumption. In the presidential election campaign for John F. Kennedy, they stated that 25 million people in the United States go to bed hungry. Time Magazine commented on his statement, stating in their opinion, 44 million people went to bed hungry every night, all because they were dieting. This fictitious remark illustrates the fact that such statistics have no basis of fact and cannot be substantiated. Our world is full of phony statistics. A phony statistic is defined to be a statistic which has no basis of fact and or whose meaning is ambiguous or unclear. So our patient circumstances, this data may determine my future choice in foods. Also, food chains in which to eat. What do we do next? I know, we want to investigate further by developing a clinical question to examine this issue. So we're going to develop a clinical question. Can you see it? We want to find the PO, PICO, or PCOT for the pickle problem. We want to find our patient or problem, our intervention or prognostic factor or exposure, a comparison, an outcome, and we'll find a time. So with this, we can identify our patient or problem. Let's start with all people, pickle eaters or not. Next, we have our intervention or prognostic factor. This would be the eating of pickles. Then we have a comparison group. We have pickle eaters versus non-pickle eaters. And then an outcome. Death, disease, war, we could choose what we want. And then we have our time. We could do 100 years or a qualitative versus a quantitative approach. So what's our level of evidence? This is another practical example. So we're gonna move away from the pickles and we're gonna go on to something else. So with this, we have parachute use to prevent death and major trauma related to gravitational challenge. This is a systematic review of randomized controlled trials. If we look at the little abstract on the left here, we can see that the objective of this was to determine whether parachutes are effective in preventing major trauma related to gravitational challenge. Essentially, are parachutes effective in preventing us from plummeting to Earth after jumping out of a plane? Huh, can't believe we have to have a systematic review, but we do. So this article is actually published in the British Journal of Medicine. What is the evaluation of evidence? They used a meta-analysis. In the hierarchy of evidence, this is a higher level of evidence. So they used a statistical approach to assess the outcomes in parachute and control groups by odd ratios and quantify the precision of estimates by 95% confidence intervals. This sounds kind of complicated. So essentially, they looked through the literature and they couldn't find any randomized control trials of a parachute being used to prevent somebody from plummeting to earth if it's not used. This seems like common sense. So what we already know about this topic, parachutes are widely used to prevent death and major injury after gravitational challenge, such as jumping out of an airplane. What they're saying this adds, this study adds to the literature. Again, no randomized control trials of parachute use have been undertaken. I can't imagine a study where too many subjects would voluntarily choose to jump out of an airplane without a parachute to see what happens. But that's just me. So what level of evidence can or will we accept? 
This is important as we're looking at the literature. Just because it's published doesn't necessarily mean it's good. So this paper has been cited as if it's serious evidence. We can actually see in the contribution that one author had the original idea. Another author tried to talk him out of it. And the second author did the first literature search, but the first author lost it. The first author drafted the manuscript, but the second author deleted all the best jokes. So we can see that some of this was written in jest. We can see that just because it follows a specific format, it was published and it's available for anyone to find. But does it hold some validity anyway? Would you really want to jump with a faulty parachute or worse, be the test subject who didn't have a parachute at all? That's kind of scary to think about. So do we want to use a parachute that's not based on any evidence? So I know I would like to use a parachute that's manufactured according to the designs that have been well tested and constructed with materials that have been well tested. I just want a parachute that's based on good research. I do not want a placebo parachute. So this article takes it one step further and they even propose future studies. Oh my, they can do better. As a premier academic institution with a heavy emphasis on producing sound clinical research, the students as Duke residents have a unique opportunity in this pivotal area of aerospace medicine. So while this study may seem a little ridiculous, this paper is obviously meant to be satire, but it was published all the same. It is still important to examine their conclusion and its clinical application to the approach of evidence when participating in evidence-based medicine. As with many interventions intended to prevent ill health, the effects of parachutes has not been subjected to rigorous evaluation by using randomized controlled trials. As the newest generation of healthcare providers, we place a huge importance on the role of evidence-based medicine in empowering our decision-making strategies for good patient care. Both examples, the pickle and the parachute, were just meant to be jokes, and they were also meant to demonstrate the purposes of research and examine some of the pitfalls. Now, as an independent clinician, you do not have to become a researcher, epidemiologist, or a statistician to practice evidence-based medicine. The focus should be on how to use research reports, not on generating them. As a clinician, it is important that we find the best medicine the best care, or the best treatment for our patients so that they have the best chance of having a good outcome. That's what I really wanted you to get out of evidence-based medicine, but hopefully we had a little fun in the meantime. You must have a solid understanding of basic research principles and study designs in order to understand and interpret the evidence. So remember sometimes as we're going through this class that there's more than one right answer. That's the hard part. How do we support that right answer? So as you're answering clinical questions, make sure you use evidence to help support them. You can use it from the textbook or go online to find other resources. So is keeping up to date mission impossible? Sometimes it feels like that. There's constantly information that's being published, data's coming out, there's new information available, especially on the World Wide Web, almost every day. So sometimes it feels like we're kind of this mouse trying to get the cheese, but it doesn't have to be. Start small, work up to finding more information about specific topics and ask for help if you need it. The biggest thing to remember with evidence-based practice is it's a process. It's something we have to continuously refine and the more clinician expertise you develop, the easier it becomes. So hang in there, it'll happen.